So I wanted to start with the 1991 uh, PGA Championship, a, a tournament, I mean, that getting into it, it didn't seem like you even had any chance at being able to play in it. Um, explain, like, how you found out you were going to be able to play and your reaction to even that. Well, I, I knew I was ninth alternate as of Monday, I think. And as of Wednesday, I was, like, second or third. I think I had to do something real close to Crooked Stick the week after. And I said, I'll just drive up. You never know. So when I got in, it was like 2 o'clock in the morning, Thursday morning, and there was a message on, on the hotel line saying that uh, you got Nick Price's spot. You'll tee off at, I think, 12-something. Uh, congratulations. Welcome to the 1991 Crooked Stick uh, PGA Championship. And this is 91 in the very early stages of starting your career to have the opportunity to uh, play, and this is a, a really big deal. Um, as, as you started having success in the tournament, tell about the note uh, that you get from your childhood idol and the, the most accomplished golfer of all time, Jack Nicholas. Yeah, I think it was uh, Sunday morning. I go to my locker, and uh, there was a note on there, go get him from Jack Nicholas. When did it dawn on you that, you know, you might really have a chance here? I don't know. It just... Um, that week was such a blur, I didn't get a practice round in, of course, and uh, Squeaky helped me an awful lot. You know, the good thing about me going into the PGA that year is I'd already secured my card for next year. That was the goal. And um, went in there and just played the golf course and just had a blast playing it. How'd the crowd reaction change over the course of the weekend? <laughs> Thursday, it was, uh, there was a few people, not many. Um, but it got a little bigger Friday than Saturday. It got really, really big. And then after I went to the preseason Colts game, you know, at Mr. Ursay Stadium there, uh, watched the Colts play the, the Rams, I think it was. Um, I had no idea they were going to introduce me on the 50-yard line. <laughs> I felt like I'd won the golf tournament already. People went nuts. And then Sunday was just like, you know, 60, 80,000 people out there just going nuts. It was great. It was uh, awesome. After winning, how... Did your life almost change overnight? It was different. It didn't dawn on me until I went out just to play a practice round or, or the pro-am. Really? Uh, yeah. It was, what, what, what do you mean it didn't dawn on you? Well, I knew it won the tournament, but, you know, you... You, you won a major. But you still are in that mentality of going, okay, I got to go the next week, and I got to go here, do this outing tomorrow, do this and that. But when I got to Colorado... That's when it dawned on me because every tournament that I've played up to the PGA in my career that year I might have signed a few autographs or some people might have seen me hit the driver, but nobody really watched John Daly play golf that year. Not a lot. And Colorado is when I realized that, wow, <laughs> I mean, it's, it was crazy. It was absolutely crazy. And there was 4,000 people sitting in front of the clubhouse and on the driving range. For, for you. Just waiting for me to get in. And I, that... Trust me, I was not used to. How do you immediately deal with something like that? Well, I kind of liked it at first, you know, and I still do. I mean, you know, but the security was great. But it took a little bit to get used to. It really did. And um, it's a great feeling to know that many people are rooting for you. Um, but that, that week was uh, interesting. The uh, 95 uh, British Open, you've said... Those four days are the best four, or were the best four days of your life. Why? Just, I'm not a big traditionalist of golf, um, but I do respect the, the, the value of the game to where I know it started there in St. Andrews. And um, to me, it's the home of golf and to win on that. And as growing up, you hear Nicholas would always say, if you win at St. Andrews, your career is complete. You hear all these guys talk about the British Open, St. Andrews. No disrespect to all the other courses or anything, but you win it at St. Andrews, you've, you've, you've pretty much accomplished a, one hell of a career. Describe what it's like uh, on that 18th hole when you're in the final group. The marshal drops the rope and the crowd is marching up behind you as you're uh, approaching the green. It's awesome. It's one, two things. You know you have a chance to win the golf tournament, and you know you're in the last group. Um, but it, it's just it's it's really the ultimate feeling to know that 
I got a British Open. And I don't know if it's age and maturity or just you'd already uh, won a major a, a few years before. Um, but it seemed like you were just able to kind of appreciate it more. Um, to describe the feeling of what it's like winning that tournament. To me, I think the British Open is probably the hardest one to win. Um, you know, you don't have a lot of qualifiers like you kind of do in the U.S. Open as we do here. So I think the two hardest tournaments on tour to win is the British and our Players' Championship because to me it's when the whole, you know, every best player in the world's playing. And so I, I rank that one very, 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 very high, probably the hardest one to win. What would you say has been the most satisfying moment from your career to date? I think winning two majors is great, but um, not playing really good for the last seven years has been tough. But having my children with me, knowing that they're safe and they're good, is the most satisfying moment right now in my life. How about the best conversation you've ever had with the president? President Clinton was just starting to play golf, and when he was a governor, I played with him one time. But you know, it's like quick draw president with the golf ball. It's like every time he'd hit one, he wouldn't even look at it. He'd already throw another ball down. <laughs> what? Yeah, I mean, it was like, <laughs> I'm going, I'm going to build up. You know, you're going to play any of these or what are you doing, man? I mean, um, he just, even if he hit a good shot, he'd throw another one down. Why? I, yeah, he's I, just mulligan. You know, mulligan what, president. What, what do you say? What can you say? He's the president of the United States. I mean, you just let him go, but... I, I did. I remember saying one time, so "You're gonna finish any of these?" He goes, "I'm just out of here having fun. I don't care, you know." But it's funny. Literally, he'd carry a lot of golf balls in his pocket, or one of his assistants would just throw it to him. Sometimes they knew when he was gonna hit another one. <laughs> so does that mean he won? No, I don't think. Oh, okay. I don't think President Clinton ever um, really took golf in a manner to where he's ever gonna compete. I think yeah. he just loves the game, loves to play it the amount of money that you've said you've lost gambling. You wrote you've lost $55 million gambling over the yeah. years. How is that even possible? Stupidity, but it is. I mean, it's, you know, we did the book, me and Glenn Wagner, we looked and we went through all my tax records to, to find out because I really didn't know, you know, um, and it just came out to that. When you add that up and realize just how stupid significant the losses are <laughs> i mean what 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 do you say when you guys first came up with that number uh, he couldn't believe it and i was shocked i i thought it might have been 20 25 but i had no idea it was 55 to 57 million um no it's crazy how, how much if at all do you regret that i I'm not going to sit here. People are going to say, I, I should say I regret it, but, you know, I did it. You know, I move on from it. Um, I had a lot of fun doing it. You know, there was, you know, that's over a, from probably 91 to 2007. Okay, you know? it's so still 55 16 million. years, <laughs> um, you know, just a little over, what, <laughs> four, four, five million a year, <laughs> maybe. Um, no, it was At three? least you can laugh that's about just, it. Three point one million dollars a year is basically what that three point two somewhere in there. Yeah, you know. only three point one or three point two million. <laughs> no, a year. I know, but uh, what what, um, what do you like about gambling? I love the action. I love the adrenaline going in there. You know, when I was playing a lot of blackjack, you could play seven hands at any amount you wanted. You know, now I think it's only three hands, pretty much all over the world. But I'd go in and play seven hands at five, ten, fifteen thousand a hand back then. Mm -hmm. But, but it seemed like, too, it was the slot machines you, you really That's liked I, e even more. And they, they had, at one of the casinos, these, like, $5,000 uh, slot machines. I started playing slots, knowing that if I took a lot less money in or didn't get a marker for it, the slots, you know, you could last a little bit longer. Um, but the win came out with a, uh, a double diamond machine with the cherry and it was a five thousand dollar one coin pool if you got a chair you got 10 grand but you're also yeah. playing five thousand twenty pools a, is a hundred grand you know and i did i played that maybe five times five or six times that it was there it's not there anymore but um 
now I go in, if I've gambled, I go in and play the $25 slots. Um, if I've hit something, I might move up to the hundreds, but um, don't do that. Don't do what I used to do anymore. Is it true that, I mean, you could be in a casino for 10, 15 hours and not even realize it? You just completely lose track of time? Oh, no doubt. I played slots for two days in a row before. I played blackjack for a day and a half or two days What before. do you mean? I mean, like... One sitting, yeah. The only time you, I'd get up is to go to the bathroom. You'd be in there for a day and a half or two yeah. days? with. Yeah. <laughs> How? Just the time goes by so fast, and, you know, if you're on a roll and you're winning... You know, I just kept on going, just kept on playing. How hard is it to stop once once you start? I'm just to feel if I've got a lot of energy and I'm gambling a little bit at the casino, it, you know, you win a few, you get a feel for it, and you just keep on playing. Sometimes I've gone in and, and played and hit $60,000, $80,000 slot machines and, and walked out. It just depends on what, you know, how I feel. And, you know, I go in to enjoy myself. I don't go in to, to win. You want to win, but I don't go in thinking I'm going to win because that's right. the worst thing you could do in a casino. I used to think that way when I oh, get the really? million, two, three million dollar markers, thinking I, I'm going to win. You know, I'm going to play these seven hands like an idiot and put 15, 20 grand on them. And, you know, I've been up four and five million dollars before and lost, end up losing two million because I wouldn't get up. How much uh, do you practice? Um, with. My son, we we do we do quite a bit, but not as much as, as of course I'd like to. You know, I've, I'm into some businesses now and homeschooling him, and um, more important, doing things with him, getting him set and and stuff like that. But uh, usually, the only time I get to practice a lot is when I'm on the road. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a golf course here that I don't get to practice that much because when I do come home, it's more of organizing, doing other stuff, and. What about the like back in the '90s? I actually practiced a lot more on the short game. Um, I would chip and putt a lot, an awful lot. But I've never been a ball beater. You know, I'll I'm not a guy that'll stand on the range for a long, long time. Although I have a few times when I'm just hitting it really, really bad. But I'm more of a guy that likes to go out on the golf course, uh, drop the shag back down, hit on a hole in practice and then hit it, hit the second shot in and just work a hole or work two or three holes to practice. But a driving range to me, it's just wide open. I lose my interest real quick. Well, and the reason I ask is because um, you said before that having practice actually makes you worse. It does, um, hitting balls, yeah. No really? Doubt. Yeah. No doubt. I mean, I don't know who said this one time, but uh, they went on the range one time and hit 12 perfect shots. And it might have been Nicholas. Psh, went straight to the tee. You know? Um, practicing to me is if you can hit... Now, a good, a good practice session would be 10 balls with each club. If I hit them really good and I feel good with it, okay, I'm done mm -hmm. for the day. If I'm not hitting it so good, then I might hit 20 balls, 20 extra balls with that club and figure it out. But you're not going to see me hit 500 to 1,000 balls on a range, but you might see me hit two or 300 wedge shots into uh -huh. a green or something like that. To me, inside of 100 yards is where the game is, but no, hitting a ton of balls is really, has never really helped me do, do you think on the you, range. Do, do you think you practiced enough, um, you know, kind of when you were in your prime? No, 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 I don't think I did, no. No, I think, a lot of times when I would come home, I'd just leave the clubs if I flew, or the, I'd just leave them in the bus, or I'd leave them in my carry bag if I ever, you know, was on a, on a trip flying or something. And that, you know, a lot of guys did that. A lot of guys would just put them up when they came home, just to get away from it. You think you made the most of your golfing talent? No, not in the 90s. What I did in the 90s, I don't know if I really could have ever been any better. Because what I'm doing now, physically, I don't think I'm near as strong, but mentally, I'm stronger than I've ever been. I just, you know, if you could just swap them, right. <laughs> maybe it'd have been a, you know, a lot better in the '90s. But um, I shot 90 at Innisbrook this year, and and I, and I I didn't really think about it too much. But Honor read to me that what Podrick said. He said, sometimes an athlete can just try too hard and care too much. And he says, that's what John did. I didn't think about it, but um, 
it makes sense. I've contradicted everything that I've ever told the press that I really didn't work hard on my game and the less I worked on it, the better I played, which I did. Mm -hmm. Now that I try and work on my game, it, it, my whole philosophy, I don't know if it's stuck in my head that maybe it doesn't help me. I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. So that's where I'm at in my career. To balance it out, why, why for me to even practice right now? I mean, it's just, but I still do, but nothing's paying off right now. Ooh, what's it been like for you going through that process and figuring it out? That's a struggle. I mean, it's, you know, you hear the stories of Ben Hogue and even Vijay Singh, the more balls you hit, the more breaks you'll get in golf. You know, well, trust me, that doesn't work because I feel like I've hit probably more balls lately in practice a little harder than I did, of course, in the 90s, but um, it's not panning out. You know, the putter, especially the putter's just been awful for a few years. Your swing. Um, explain how the set of clubs that you got when you were a kid has had so much impact on the, the swing you ultimately developed. When I started, um, all I had was my uh, set of Jack Nicholas McGregor's. Um, they were men's set, so I started when I was four. Of course, it was a little heavy, so when I took it back, it would almost hit the ground. Right. And I never wanted them to change. Um, my dad wanted to cut them down. I didn't want him to. And that's how I got the long, the long backswing. You were first in driving distance for years and years and years uh, on the tour. But even from when you were a kid to when you were a professional, people have wanted to you know, change your swing, get you to weaken your grip, et cetera. Why do you think um, there's been so much attention paid to it over the years? I'll never forget, uh, I think it was Coach Clayton at Texas said, if you don't shorten that swing, you'll never play professional golf. And a lot of people wanted me to change my grip, weaken it, and shorten the swing, and take it more outside. And, you know, but I started playing as four years old, and that's, that's the, the way I played. It would have been impossible for me to try and change. I was talking to your good friend Mark, and uh, he, he was saying you have been, I mean, really frustrated. Um, you know, with where you're at now um, as a pro, pro golfer. Um, how, in your opinion, do you kind of get out of that kind of mental, you know, kind of state of frustration? Well, I keep telling myself, you know what, I, I should be retired by now. So I'm thinking the philosophy of going, okay, most hockey players of my age are retired, all of them are, NBA players are retired, baseball players. Football players, no doubt. You know, every sport in the book, most professional athletes are are, are retired, are done. I'm in Europe. You know, I can play a few of those, and I should hopefully get a few exemptions for the next two years and play the Champions Tour. So I need to just that kind of basically knows. Hey, I still have a job. Right. You know, I still have a life. I have wonderful sponsors in Loudmouth and non nunchuck irons, shafts, and um, a lot of other stuff business things that I'm doing and um, you know it's because of golf that I could still do this and I have to look at it that way. How do you avoid taking a bad round home with you? Um, it's it's gotten easier because I've had so many of them <laughs> <laughs> lately but um, it used to it was tough it used to it was it was very very tough for me to play bad um, feel like I let people down, let myself down, especially when I kind of gave the I don't care attitude, um, you know, not thinking of what it could do to people who are watching and stuff. Um, I don't do that anymore. Um, at least I haven't in a long time. I'm not going to say I never will. It's golf. It's crazy. I don't know if it's gotten easier because I just haven't played great or if I'm just maybe a little more mature and think about, okay, what do I need to work on to get better? when you would have a bad round, you're on the road, you'd come back and you would just destroy the uh, hotel room. W what was it about that that, um, I don't know if it helped? Or? Well, I mean, you know, you hear, you see people, these commercials now, the banging bag, you know, and you take a, a bat and bang a bag, or some people are paying to do this now so they don't destroy stuff. I mean. To me, that's what it did. Sometimes I'd beat my bus up. Sometimes I'd beat my car up. Sometimes I'd beat a hotel room up. Um, what would happen that would lead to it? Oh, just bad golf or, you know, 
<laughs> somebody poking at me, pushing me to the limits, you know. Uh, you know, the only thing I've ever done is, is hurt myself. I haven't hurt anybody else, thank God. For well, well d and describe what happened once where you put, put the hand through a television set. It didn't go through in South Africa. <laughs> oh, it didn't go no, through? No, it didn't go through. It's, that's back in the late 80s. Well, I thought I was strong enough to put my hand through it. And it was after the first round of Swaziland, the South African tour. And I think I had like 8,200 bucks in my name. And uh, me and Dale just got a divorce and she kind of took the money. And I was upset that we got a divorce and all that. And so I beat up a hotel room and I still had another round of golf to play. Maybe two if I make the cut. Yeah. Well, I was fortunate the hand was bandaged up and the guy catting for me now, Peter Vondry, was playing with me the first two days. And he goes, he always called me pro. Pro, you're not playing. There's no way you're playing today. How, how bad was the hand? It was broke. So this big Swedish guy, Nano, Nano, Nanu or Nano, he bandaged it up and says, you try play. I just gripped the left hand tighter and next thing you know, come Sunday, I beat John Bland in the final round and won the tournament. And what I'd done to the hotel was about 20,000 rand worth of damage. Well, that's what I won the tournament. So I ended up giving them that back. So it was <laughs> so, a wash. Just a wash. <laughs> uh, an argument uh, that, that you had uh, with your wife, at your then wife at uh, your Colorado home. Uh, explain how you took out the frustration on the house. Yeah, I beat up my office, beat up uh, a little bit of the house. And it was ironic because there was some friends there, over six to eight people there saw the whole thing. My brother was there and how I got like called a wife beater and all this, you know, uh, was the damnedest thing. Apparently Betty had said something that I might have pushed her or touched her hair, but everybody saw what I did. There right. were so many witnesses there. And well, NFL Hall of Famer Dan Hampton was uh, there. Hampton and Dan and Julie were there. Uh, my brother and his girl were there. I mean, it, everybody saw it, and they were shocked that Betty would actually come out and say something that stupid. Next thing you know, I got to go back to Colorado you know, report, and then she dropped the charges after the press had already annihilated me. Barbara Walters put me on there as a wife beater, I think. And, really? And that that really sucked. I mean, that was sad for for her to do that to me, but less, but take her word for it when, I admit, when I do something wrong, yeah, I beat the hell out of my house, but no, never have I laid a hand on a woman, you know. You've, you know, been married and divorced uh, four times. Why do you think it always goes downhill after marriage, as you kind of said in your book? I don't know. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I think it takes two people to run a marriage because it definitely takes two people to get married, but it also takes two people to run one. So it's not all her fault, my fault or whatever. It's both of our faults. You've had a girlfriend now of uh, six years, uh, Anna. You still believe in marriage? I do, but we're not pushing each other right now. Yeah. You know, we're not pushing the fact that we're very happy the way things are right now. And, um, you know, one morning I might wake up and say, hey, let's go get married or something, you know. Um, but right now we're just happy. We're, we get along just fine. She's been a blessing for me. and. Um, Little John gets a little upset with her, but that's good because Anna's is very strict. What was it you said? Uh, maybe when you're in the old folks' home, someday <laughs> you'll. Well, I did propose, propose. to Anna. I mean, we're we're scheduled to get married in 2029. I think. 2020, and why why 2029? I think I'll be ready to settle down. I'll be 63. <laughs> so, why do you believe sex helps your golf game? I always have. I'm somewhat of an info, anyways. So apparently, um, according to the book. I, I don't know. I just love it. I, I just feel like in the mornings, especially. I mean, it makes a great day. Start the day off right. Positive attitude. You feel good, knowing somebody loves you. When you aren't getting sex, do you not play as well? No, I don't usually. <laughs> but trust me, me and Anna have plenty of sex. So <laughs> I, I know say, where you're going with this, point? but <laughs> no, I mean it's. <laughs> I haven't been playing great golf, but that's not because of that, I promise you. But no, it's just, 
I don't know. I just I love sex. I, I love it. Yeah, I mean, I you said know. in the book like three or four times a day, and that you're horny all the time. Yeah, I, am. I mean, this was Sick. 2006. You wrote the book. I'm you still think... the same way too. I, I just stupid, but I don't know. I just love it. You and you really try and like best your own sex records of times in a day. Well, t uh, yeah, I think Betty and I did it ten times one day. If I'm not mistaken, it's been a long, long time ago. We did it ten times one day. That all you do in the day? I just laid around and had sex all day. Yeah, it was raining. You calculated that um, you, you smoke up to eighteen thousand cigarettes a year, and that was calculation you had in your book, just based on two to three packs of cigarettes a, a day. Um, yeah, I don't know if you're still smoking that much, but h how long have you smoked that much for? I started smoking when I was nineteen. Smoked for almost 29 years. Um, I smoked about the same as the book, two packs, two, two and a half packs a day. But at that time, I had started smoking that much. Before that, I was only smoking maybe a pack, pack, pack and a half. Any desire to stop? I, no. None? <laughs> no, not really. So you've also calculated that you drink upwards of 515 gallons of Diet Coke a year, and that was based on drinking 15 cans of Diet Coke a day, and it might have lessened <laughs> some, but how, how do you even consume that much soda in a day? I used to drink anywhere from 12 to 20 Diet Cokes a day. How? I went to McDonald's three or four times a day. To me, they always had the best fountain drink, fountain Diet Coke. I don't know, because I don't drink water. I hate water. I cannot stand to you, drink you, water. You don't drink water at all? No, Rich Beam and some of the guys, they call me the camel because I don't drink water. I never drink water on tour. Uh, how often did you used to eat McDonald's? Quite a bit. You know, Burger King, McDonald's, Taco Bell, all of them. And what's quite a bit? Um, I, could, I used to be able to eat like two Big Macs, two or three cheeseburgers, a chocolate shake, a diet, or a regular Coke back then, you know, before I started drinking Diet Cokes in a sitting pretty easily. In a sitting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what was your diet when you won the British Open? Um, I don't think it was that bad. I think when I won the British, I was only like what do you mean? I thought, I thought you were eating like I the eating whole British Open. You were downing like multiple packs of M&Ms and, yeah. and chocolate cookies and chocolate muffins. and. Oh, yeah. What's wrong with that? But I only weighed like 225 when I won the British. But see, I wasn't drinking, you know. Um, and I was really struggling with it back then when I wasn't drinking. Because your body was craving, craving the sugar. sugar that you yeah. had been getting from alcohol. alcohol so what, like, yeah. what were you doing to replace that? I was M&M's, peanut M&M's, loved them. How um, much? Probably four to six of those, the, the packs a day. Or if it was ice cream, I still eat, loved to eat chocolate ice cream. Uh, how did your college coach, who's now Phil Mickelson's agent, change your diet? Well, he, he put me on a diet, a very strict diet. It was to an extreme of what the lap band, I think, did. I lost, when Coach Lloyd took over, he says, you're going to lose at least 60, 70 pounds before you play for this golf team. And I weighed like one, I weighed like 230, maybe 235. Well, and then in addition to that, you hated cigarettes at the time. But mm -hmm. didn't he start you yeah, smoking he's, cigarettes? he used to smoke Marlboro Lights, and he said, just start smoking. Here, have a cigarette. And isn't Whatever that, you got to do to keep the weight off. Isn't that the most amazing thing you've ever heard? Here's an athletic coach <laughs> encouraging one of his players to do something that is obviously detrimental to his health. But, you know, 84 and all that, smoking, yeah, but it wasn't talked about like it is now. And I honestly think Coach wanted me to lose the weight and keep it off. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was a tough, tough coach. Um you know, the way he did things, some of it was good, some of it was bad, like any other coach. But um, I wanted to play for the University of Arkansas. I wanted to play for the Hogs, and, and I was going to starve myself to do it. I didn't care how I had to do it. How challenging was that period? I mean, with, as you said, starving yourself? It was tough. I ended up, I remember I ended up in the, in the hospital there in Fayetteville, dry heaving because I was dehydrated, having eaten. And the first person I saw was Coach. And, you know, I don't know if Coach Lloyd, I think he was happy that I didn't die, but I don't think he wanted me to change anything. Wow. 
he wanted the weight off. So you mentioned the lap band uh, surgery. You have it in 2008 to help in losing weight. You've, you know, been as low as 175 pounds, as high as uh, around 320 pounds. Your brother, uh, Jamie, told me, looking back, you regret having gotten it. Um, why? The surgery? Uh -huh. No, no, I don't okay. regret getting it. No, he regrets me getting it. I don't think he, he liked me getting it because he saw how much weight I lost really, really fast. And, I mean, there was times where they, the people around here just thought I'd look dead, like a walking zombie. I mean. W why? Because I was so thin, it just didn't fit me. Um, and the, you did not like being that thin? I, 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 enjoy, I enjoyed it, but I didn't like not feeling good. I would rather be where I am now, feeling somewhat healthy, than maybe looking a little better at 175 pounds, but not feeling healthy. Mm -hmm. I mean, it got to the point when it really hit me, it was John Deere. And the guys I was playing with, um, I think it was Todd Hamilton and David Duvall. And they're not short hitters, but I was always like 15, maybe 20 yards past them. They were hitting it past me. And my case is, look, John, I'm not going to tell you business, but you've got to gain some weight back. You, you're, I could barely get up a hill. Well, some people are, are meant to be a little heavy to be healthy. I don't agree with uh, you know, I'm five, almost 5'11". Five I'm supposed to weigh 184 pounds in my height. I just don't see it. Um, I'm big boned. You know, I'm not a, a, I'm not a skinny bone. I have, I have somewhat big arms, big legs. It'd be hard for me to feel healthy at 184 pounds. You once said, uh, if I could play the tour drunk, I'd win every week. <laughs> um, how, how much do, do, do you like realistically believe if you were able to uh, drink, you, you know, when you were playing, you'd play better? It's amazing. Where I would go, I'd, wherever I set course records or whatever, I would be barefooted, drunk, playing golf, making every 20-footer I looked at. I used to be able to shoot pool really good when I was, had a great buzz going. But if you get me sober and play pool, I wouldn't make a ball. I don't know. It, it's, yeah, but couldn't that also be because you're drunk and just think you're playing better than you actually are? Well, no. When you're winning money from people playing pool, you you know you, you know you're playing better. I mean, your body's relaxed. You have confidence in yourself to do things more. Maybe it's more aggressive in a good way, not a bad way. Um, I don't know. I'm not making an excuse to drink or anything sure. because. Uh, but I, when I had a good buzz going, I could play. I thought I could make everything, play really good golf. And I think it's just because the body's so loose and you know, it's like free, you know. How often would you play professional golf hungover uh, back in the day? A lot. I shot some really good numbers. <laughs> Did you? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I mean, I wasn't drinking on tour, but there was some times uh, on tour that I didn't sober up to about the 13th hole. 13th or 14th hole. So uh, you were basically drunk w when you were playing? Yeah, you get in at 7, 7.30 in the morning. I got a tee time at 8.05 or 9 o'clock, you know. You'd be out till Sometimes, 7 or yeah. 7.30 yeah. in the morning when you had an 8 a.m. tee time? Yeah. <laughs> how, how do you get ready to, I mean, how, how do you play when, you know, you're up just, to just all hours and no good? I got a lot of practice in South Africa from it. From <laughs> my buddies there, we <laughs> stuff. So on a rain delay, a few rain delays at certain different tournaments. Me and some of these guys that like David Faraday and Peter and Ronnie McCann, the Pappas, we would sit in those tents and get absolutely hammered during a rain delay. Next thing you know, it'd be the next day we'd be in the same clothes and we'd go out and play the play the <laughs> tournament in the same clothes. When you were uh drinking the most how many beers or how much liquor would you drink daily I don't know um I could drink probably a case to 35 beers easily in a day in a 40 day beers yeah 35 easily. or 40 easily in a day yeah and how, how do you feel at the end of 35 or 40 beers still start drinking some whiskey or something <laughs> I don't know I just really yeah I just does wouldn't even phase you. No, it's. <laughs> I don't know. You gotta ask everybody around here or everybody around me. I, I don't know. I, I was a. Pat Perez. <laughs> he says, um, 
when I drank beer in front of him, he goes, my God, that there was like two seconds and the beer was gone. I mean, like, he says, do you not have an esophagus? Because <laughs> I, I didn't drink beer. I guzzled beer. I just wasn't a guy that would do that. I was always a guy that would kind of do that when it came to beer out of bottles. So like two drink, two two sips or two gulps out of a beer bottle, I was done with it. And how often would you drink? I mean, every day? No, no, I was never the guy. I was a, I'm a binge, I was a binge drinker, you know, and that's, to me, I could go two months without drinking, but if I get on a binge, I could drink for three months or seven days or two days. It just depends. I mean, when I wanted it, when I wanted to quit drinking. What was your drink of choice? Back in college, it was Jack Daniels. Miller Lite was always my beer. Um, and then I moved over to Crown. Early 2000. Early 2000. To, to, to what extent, looking back on, on that period, did you find it difficult to, you know, manage the fun lifestyle and the partying with the professional career? I don't know. I'm, I think this in the 2000s I've, I've done pretty good. I think the 90s is when it was just, I just didn't think about some of the things that, that could have happened or would have happened or did happen. Yeah. Um, but like this, in the 2000s, I don't think there's been really any incidents that have hurt me or anything, um, except maybe the, the, the one night in jail when I fell asleep in a bus, I didn't do anything wrong. I I don't still to this day don't know why I was in the jail cell, honestly do not. I know why the other guys were, but I have no idea why I was. And they told me because I didn't have a ride from a a restaurant. Is so it you're but, just drunk asleep on a bus? Well, I'd already almost sobered up by then. I'd okay. been asleep for three or four hours, so it's not like I never. I don't even remember. Don't even remember talking to the cops. To be honest with you, I was out. I was like, you know, you wake up and you're like, it takes you a few minutes. Next yeah, thing you know, sure. I'm getting thrown off a bus and handcuffed for reasons I don't even know. You know, there's no, no police report was filed. There's nothing on my record. And, you know, that hurt. That really hurt a lot. You wrote in your book that if you were still drinking whiskey, um, you would be dead. Why do you believe that? I think with, with whiskey, I think if I was to drink a fifth to two fifths a day, like it, it had gotten going there for a while, you know, I think as we get older, your body just can't take it. You know, I think that's kind of what I meant. If I keep doing that, I, you know, I, I just don't see how anybody could drink that much whiskey. And I don't know how the hell I did. What's the story the nurse told you about how high your blood alcohol level was at one point? Yeah, that was when I was kind of young, too. That was like in Moralton, Arkansas, I think. Um, I had passed out and... They said they had to pump my stomach and all this, that I was out, that I was dead for over nine seconds or something. That you were dead uh, for over nine seconds? Eight or nine seconds. They had to revive me, and they said my bl blood alcohol level was almost to four, 3.7 or 3.6. It was just, they never seen anything like it. But that happens a lot when people binge drink because just, it just keeps going. You just keep drinking and drinking. You never really sober up. Um, that number might be high, I don't know. It could have been two point something, but it was fatal, whatever the hell that number was. I can't remember what it was, but I heard it was, she told me it was high. And then they did tests and my liver was not too good, you know, from drinking so much. You previously spent time in rehab. Looking back, what do you think you learned from those experiences? Um, you know, I think if somebody wants to quit drinking and there's so many different ways you do it. Just do it the way that makes you quit drinking. Like you asked me the question if I want to quit smoking. Well, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if other people want you to quit smoking or other people want you to quit drinking. It, it takes you to do it. And I'm not going to sit here and say that I'm never going to drink again. Um, I think I've had one Crown and Diet Coke in six years. Um, but I, I don't think I'm the type of guy that needs to go to the meetings and to involve myself into all that over again because that's the reason I started drinking again back when, when I started really drinking a lot after Betty Ford in 97. What, what about that made you? I couldn't stand to go to the meetings and listen to everybody how they used to drink, why they did this or this and that. It just, I, I didn't want to live in the past. 
And I know I went to a lot of different meetings. I know I should maybe kept going and going and going to them, but I just I just gave up on the meetings. And, and but there's nothing wrong with that. Nobody says you have to go to the meetings. Nobody says that's the hundred percent cure either. Mm -hmm. But um, I just feel like for people listening to this interview, that if you want to quit something, you don't always have to listen to the people that are telling you to quit. It's not going to do you any good. You got to listen to yourself if you want to quit something. That's called the first step basically you know you admit that you have a problem now you have to do something about it you know nobody can make anybody quit anything there were two different occasions when you were I think on the highway driving to rehab um, where you had actually contemplated suicide yeah I was on a mountain in Palm Springs ready to just drive off of it what were you like thinking about then that had you in that mental space? I think just getting pulled a million different ways and trying to take in what everybody was saying and then I got to go to rehab in 92 or whatever. Um, I don't know. I just thought, it, is it really worth it? But I just, I, I think just knowing I had kids or if it was Shina, um, that I want to watch her grow up. I don't, I don't want her to lose her dad. You know, speaking of kids, it was uh, little John and wanting to get custody of him. Your girlfriend, Anna, was telling me that really made you stop drinking cold turkey. Um, what was it uh, about that that really was what got you to stop? Sure, he made it very difficult to see him. And it, was, and it got to the point where, you know, the judge had had enough and blah, blah, blah. But... When I was getting him, we just had the time of our lives, and I didn't have to go sit at the club here and get drunk. I didn't have to go out and get drunk. I didn't have to go do this. I just wanted to be with him. I want to uh, take you back to when you were growing up. You mentioned your mom. Uh, your father was gone a lot for work, would be gone for a couple months at a time. Uh, your mother would often travel with him. How much were they around when you were growing up? There was times that uh, mom would go with dad for two or three weeks when we were here finishing school, me and my brother kind of by ourselves finishing school. But um, dad was, it seemed like my dad worked more nights than he did days. Um, so a lot of times dad would sleep, sleep during the day. Um, but relationship between me and my mom, my mom's like an angel. I mean, she just knew no matter how bad the problem was or what was going on, she just always had the right thing to say. When you're going through tough times occasionally, you'll say, I, I wish my mom was here. Oh yeah, all the time. Why? You just, mom is always a great shoulder to cry on or, or she's always there for me when things were great and when things were bad. And I think, I look at my mom as being just an unbelievable woman to put up with the things that my dad did. But then I look at, you know, my life that when things were bad with all my wives, they just were gone. When things were great, man, they were just right there by your side. But when things were bad, phew, gone. The wives were gone. Yeah, that's why Anna has been so special because honestly in my career it's been horrible. Now I've had a few good tournaments, but Anna stuck right there with me no matter what. How do you view your dad? Um, tough love. Very, very tough love, or even if it is love. I, I don't know what it was, to be honest with you, or what it is. Why do you wonder if it's love? I don't know. Dad's just different. You know, he's in his 80s now. I don't talk to him that much. Um, I just, as a kid, and I think Jamie may have tested this too, uh, he just hit us a lot for no reason. Um, beat us up for no reason, spanked us for no reason. Plenty of times he spanked us, we needed to be spanked. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of them I didn't understand why. Um, and I tried to deal with it for a long time and then um, right before mom had passed away, he'd put a gun in, in my eye and almost killed me and I, I just kind of put him out of my life since then. Explain what happened in that situation. Well, it was July 4th weekend, me and Sherry had we actually gone to the bus because we had so many people here um, to lay down and go to sleep. And next thing you know, Dad's following, I think her name was Kelly, following her on the bus and grabbing at her and stuff. And Kelly was like paranoid and saying, I said, Dad, 
You get off the bus, go home, you're drunk, please leave her alone, blah, blah, blah. Well, next thing you know, he, he didn't want to leave, so I got my brother and we walked him back and I said, Dad, just lay down and go to sleep, please. Just. And Shauna was there, and I didn't know she was there until actually, I guess when I had turned around and saw Dad, he had put the gun in my eye, who are you, get the hell out of my house, blah, blah, blah. My poor daughter saw it all. and. My brother just grabbed the, the gun from his, he pushed the gun away, and I thought Jamie had killed him because he shoved his head through the wall. And when he grabbed the gun, then shoved his head through the wall, and he shot the gun off. And then I think my dad realized, whoa, you know, what the hell happened? And, but he could have shot me. What, what was the conversation like with him the day after the incident? Or when I, you guys first spoke about it? I don't even think I talked to dad for quite a while. I know I went over and talked to mom. Mom was going to divorce him and all this and that. I said, I didn't talk to dad for a long, long time. Uh, I didn't. And my dad is, um, he's just, just, it's just tough. It's just tough. I, I was talking to your girlfriend, Anna, and she says um, that she believes deep down you really would like to see that relationship repaired. Um, what do you think of that? I don't know. I just, I've tried it so many times. And now don't get me wrong, my dad's not the most evil person in the world. I mean, he provided, he worked, he provided for us. He, he always made sure I had a place to, to play golf if I needed it or could, um, baseball, football. I, I, I love him for that. But I didn't need that from him. All I wanted was his love and like to be able to have a conversation that my son can have with me about, you know, certain problems and stuff. And dad was very, very difficult to talk to even as a kid even when I won the PGA and we just never have had that that bond that a father and son that hopefully when little John gets older we'll still have it you know we all change and we get older <laughs> how's uh, homeschooling little John uh, we're in the sixth grade now <laughs> we it's I got him when he was in the first grade but he wasn't gonna pass it um, he had missed way too many days so I've got him through five grades in three and a half years, four years. And this is like four or five hours daily, isn't it? Oh yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's at least four, four and a half hours, five, yeah. So when uh, will he, yeah, I know there's a plan at some point to put him into regular school, and I, I think in part because of ha how well he's doing in athletics and his interest in uh, pursuing that, but when does that happen and how hard will it be on you? Well, I think it it'll be, Whatever, it's going to be better for him. I think either way, homeschooling is great. Or the only thing is not him not being able to be with other kids. Right. The seventh grade is when he can really start playing the sports, uh, you know. And that, I guess in, he should enjoy it while it lasts because not every kid can be learning math while in Asia with their dad or Europe with their dad or Africa or all over the Unfortunately, U.S. Unfortunately, kids, so. kids their age don't really care. Right. <laughs> they want to know where the food is, what, what's next, where the movies are. Hey, can I get this game? Your thoughts on some golfers today. I just want to name a few names and get the first thing that comes to mind. Tiger Woods. Legendary, and he's still got majors in him. What did you think of the sex scandal? To be honest with him, with I think he just, I don't think it was near that many women. And I think, uh, you know, I don't want to speak for Tiger, but I know in the situation, if I was going to go out and cheat on somebody, the only reason why I would is because they quit having sex with me. Bubba Watson. Talented, hits it a mile. Don't really know Bubba that well. But you guys have the drive in common. Yeah, yeah, he, he bombs it. There's no doubt about it. I mean, you, you really bombed it, but he's, you know, has a decent drive going on him as well. Yeah, yeah, there's no doubt. I, and him winning another green jacket, it's great for him. And, you know, it's Bubba's kind of like a, a kind of a blue-collar guy like me. You know, I don't think he grew up in, you know, having everything given to him and all that, so I respect him. Uh, Phil Mickelson. He's... Uh, Pretty much a legend on the on the tour now, and I'm sure deep in his mind he thought he may never win one because he got him a little late in his career. And um, I don't really know Phil that well, but I've talked to him. He's always been nice to me, and 
Of course, Amy's just a sweetheart. Uh, Rory McElroy. Rory, don't know. We say hi every yep. now and then, but phenomenal what I saw when he did at Key Island, putting like that. Um, guy's got all the talent in the world. He's going to win a lot more.